All right, Colossians chapter 3. Let's pick up in verse 12 and read down through 17 as we see Paul address how Christians are to adopt certain attitudes and behaviors. In Colossians 3, 12 through 17, who will read that for us? Rock. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalm and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Okay. So question number four, I'd ask, how are the elect of God to feel and act toward one another, as he mentions there in verse 12? How would you describe that? And we can look at specifics, but... Showing love. Showing love is the best all around. Okay. It sort of fits all around. Yeah, yeah. So, showing love toward one another, act like a beloved family. Um, I know all of us don't have families necessarily that we're close to or we get along with. I get that. I understand that. Um, but I think we all have a concept of an ideal family, being close and loving and helpful and encouraging. And that's what he's telling us to do as the family of God, how we are to be toward one another. Um, he mentions, of course, that we are the elect of God, holy and beloved. That's the idea of being wholly separate to God and beloved of God. And as this family, we're all a part. All the elect are a part of that. And so here's attitudes you need to have toward each other. Those tender mercies, a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and so on toward one another. Uh, does anybody want to address something specific in that list? All right then. Um, when he talks about us having these attitudes toward one another, including and forgiving one another, is he saying, just overlook sin? What, what's he saying here? He's putting a condition to this, and the condition is, as Christ forgave you, and we understand what that process of seeking forgiveness you know, for our sins or from God or Christ is. It requires repentance or turning away, a change. Right, exactly right. Um, and, and I think people get confused about this concept of forgiving each other. We are not to hold a grudge, no matter what it is. We don't hold grudges, we don't have bitterness, things like that. But if a member of the church commits sin, they, they are persistent in a sin in their life, there are certain things that a congregation is required to do. And that includes withdrawing the fellowship. And so we can't just say, well, you know what, I'm just going to forgive that person because then fellowship is reestablished when that forgiveness takes place, right? So somebody who is living in sin, they need to come out of that sin. And we then are willing to forgive them. We have that forgiving heart. One of the things, the idea overall here is we're trying to help each other to get to heaven. And so we want them to turn from their sin. And so we work with them to help them to get out of their sin. Mike. Well, you know, even in our sins, <clears throat> Christ died for the sinners. God showed His love towards sinners through His the death of His Son. That doesn't mean, you know, just because forgiveness doesn't come doesn't mean that there's no love. Right. And, you know, that's the same thing that we see here. It says beyond all these things, put on love. And so, you know, the forgiveness that we, we give, we can't be 
be more forgiving to what God is. Because God is the one that establishes what true fellowship is with, with one another. And if one decides that they're going to break away from that, that's not anything that we can repair. They have to repair that with God. That's between them and God. And whenever they do repair that with God, that's whenever forgiveness begins with God, and it ought to start with us also. Right. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 says, when you withdraw from someone, you don't treat them as an enemy, but you admonish them as a brother. That love still continues on. Paul, you have something? Yeah, that, that's all I started to say. You know, uh, that's because a man living in sin, you can't hate him. That's when he needs your love the most. To draw it back. To, to draw it back. Right. To reality. Right. Um, and there, there's another point maybe to be made. You know, there are times when people say or do things that it hurts us. Some of those things you just got to let go. You just overlook, you just press on. You know, maybe it was thoughtless, maybe it was kind of mean, but you wouldn't necessarily classify it in that category of they've committed a sin against me, they have violated the will of God. Maybe it's just something that personally bothered me, troubled me. Some of those things you just got to overlook. Just, okay, move on. I know them overall, they're good, they're decent, they're, they're not, you know, stubborn and wicked and so let's let's just move on here, Mike. Well, you know, even if we're brought and you know our relationships, they ought to be viewed as this. This is not something I do to someone. It's something I do for someone. Mm -hmm. We withdraw for them to save their souls. Mm -hmm. You know, I withdraw myself for them, and you know, even the, you know the, the love that we show is for them. Mm -hmm. And. Um, you know, that keeps us in a mindset of servitude towards one another and humility towards one another. Right. Serving. We're serving them in these things. All right, question number five then I ask, where may we find the peace of God? It says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, verse 15. In the one body. Right? Right? That's where you have the peace of God is in the one body. Outside the, that one body, you don't have the peace of God. And that's as simple as you can get it. It's the saved versus those who are not saved. So we have the peace of God in that one body and enjoy it there. And so we need to appreciate that relationship we have in that one body and the blessing of being there, being a part of the elect, being a part of the called out, to have that fellowship with God, to have that peace that passes understanding, if you will. All right, any other thoughts there? Yep. We, uh, these verses are really great, and that's God's will, and that's what we need to look at. But you and I, we're, we're great. But if one of us falls away, that when your love ought to kick in. We need to try to draw them back with all diligence. I would argue our love needs to kick in before that. Well, most of the time that's true, but... All the time that's true. Well, we, we should love that. each other before somebody falls away. Well, we don't... And we, we don't should be acting in love. We feel the love until we need it. In, in reality. Well, sometimes you can prevent someone. If you see them maybe growing weak, you show that love to them and they won't fall away. But I take your point that when they fall away, you need to take action. And generally that's in trying to sit down and talk with them, have conversations, maybe write a letter, uh, try to help them to see, hey, you're, you're headed the wrong way here and this can't be tolerated in the congregation. And you need to change this for your life. Otherwise, we're, we're going to have to take action. So, point taken. Very good. Alright, so in verse 16 then, he talks about let the word of Christ dwell in us. What is that? How does that happen? Sometimes that makes uh, that 
sometimes that tough love, you really have to tell them where they're wrong. Yes, but in verse 16, the word of Christ, what is that? Ron? Well, that is the gospel. And he goes on and explains to us in this verse how we accomplish that. And he says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So as we are now assembled together here, and you're teaching and instructing and imparting these words of truth into our minds. And then when we later in, in our service will sing songs and meditate upon those words, then we are putting the word of God into our hearts as he is saying here, and it dwells within us because we're renewing our thoughts as we come together and as you teach and instruct and preach other means. Right, right. Clint, did you have something? So the word of Christ, we want to understand, is the entirety of the New Testament. Some people want to break it down and say, well, it's just the, the red letters, which, by the way, I cannot stand red letter versions. I have one, but it's because of other reasons. But because people have this concept that, oh, that's what Jesus said, so that means more than what the apostles said. But the problem with that is Jesus sent the apostles to reveal all truth, and we have the bulk of our teaching and understanding through the apostles and prophets. In fact, they're the ones who actually wrote down what Jesus said. But be that as it may, you, you've got to understand we have to accept, people around us need to accept the entirety of the New Testament is what we need to know, what we need to live by, is the authority in religious matters. Chris? By staying in the Word and studying the Word, we're constantly feeding and nourishing our soul. Yes. And that's what we have to have. He says, let it dwell in you richly. What does it mean, dwell in you richly? More than anything. Yeah. Okay. You have a lot of it. And, you know, the thing is, it's well enough, I guess, to just say that we just need to read, but it's the practical application of it that it, it ought to be manifested through. I mean, just like, you know, we've been studying John, how Christ was the Word manifested, we have to be the Word manifested as well. And if it says love one another, we have to strive to figure out how do I show that in action? So the words of the page go into my heart and then my action comes out because of it. Yeah, it shapes our thinking, our outlook, and drives our actions. Exactly right. So it's to dwell in us richly, fully, completely, overflowing, if you will, in all wisdom and teaching, that wisdom, the application of the knowledge, teaching and admonishing one another, as Ron mentioned a moment ago, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, we teach it and admonish. Um, it helps that word to dwell within us. And singing, we need to understand, it's, it's praise of God, but it's also a teaching activity that we're doing. As we sing together, we're teaching, admonishing, because the things that we sing have biblical principles in them, if not an actual psalm that we sing and concepts from the Word of God that we are singing and we're reminding ourselves and we're ingraining it in us. Um, singing. Mike, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, whenever I go home today and, you know, even like last Sunday or Wednesday or whatever, I mean, you know, no disrespect to you, you're a good preacher. But I wasn't sitting there quoting about your sermon, but I was singing in my head and out loud sometimes some of the songs that we sing because it's repetitive, it's something that we're familiar with and continues to teach us throughout the day. And, um, you know, so I think that's why it's very important that we understand that we're part of that and we throw ourselves into that because in that, you know, we go away from here using the songs that we kind of remember and stuff like that. And you know, okay. All right. Um, not everybody here will be able to answer this question that I'm getting ready to ask. Mm -hmm. But who, who can remember a song you heard on the radio, I would say probably multiple times, from 20, 30, 40 years ago? 
if it came on the radio, you could you could start the lyrics with it. Okay? What does singing do for us? And I I don't I just don't understand it. Maybe there's a brain scientist out there that knows this stuff, but for some reason putting words with a tune, matching those together, and you say those multiple times, it's just shoo, boy, it sinks in. It's just like with children, whenever you're teaching them in the Bible class, whenever you do something to song, it's so much easier for them to retain. Books of the Bible, yeah. names of the apostles. And even me. <laughs> but yeah, not, yeah. Not just the children. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Singing helps to ingrain those concepts into our minds. You know, here we are, a bit strange pilgrims. It reminds us we're just here temporarily. Um, you know, love one another. Uh, all kinds of things that get ingrained in us, and that's one of the great beauties and blessings of a singing service. An instrument cannot do that. You know, a, a guitar or a piano cannot it's impossible for it to do that but you and i using our voices saying words to tunes to each other that ingrains things into our hearts and into our minds and helps the word of god dwell in us richly and also singing you know sometimes we get a um, uh, a bad rap should i say that we don't have emotion Right, because you know, as a preacher, I, I know I get a little emotional sometimes. But you know, not like what you see out there in the world, and just going crazy. And and nowadays they do all kinds of things, dancing, jumping, shouting, hollering, all that kind of stuff. Singing is that emotional part of our worship service. It really draws on our emotions and deeply can move us can move us to tears at times as we sing different things, as we reflect on the, the concepts that we're singing about. So it's an emotional release, an emotional expression for all of us as we're before God and singing to Him, praising Him, teaching, admonishing one another. Any other thoughts? Just to that point, the emotional part of it. Singing with grace in your heart, stupid. So if it's coming from and you're putting it in your heart, there's emotion attached to it. So mm -hmm. yeah. it is. Mike. These songs also allow not just the writer but us to be able to express what's in our hearts. <laughs> you know, I mean, and it doesn't say just quote scripture over and over and over in some kind of melodic tune. Mm -hmm. What it says is spiritual songs also. What is inside of your heart? Let it come out. Mm -hmm. And you know, so we you know, participate in that. Right, and thankfully, down through the ages, there have been writers or poets that have put down beautiful thoughts for us. And if they're scriptural thoughts, they are excellent for us to, to sing and to use as we worship God together. All right, verse. Or question number six, rather. Question number six, verse 17. I ask you to list as many reasons as you can why we must do everything in the name of Jesus. Whatever you do, word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. <coughs> why? Clint? We have to be within His authority. We can't step outside of that. So it's, it's matching the pattern. It's doing what... Jesus taught the apostles, the apostles taught the next, and, and so on. And we don't deviate from that. Otherwise, we're outside of the realm that God, the Son, the Spirit has defined for us. If we're okay. not dwelling richly with the Word, if we're not in the Word, we've stepped outside of those words, we're no longer there. We're lost. Right. So we could sum up what you said, He has authority. That's, that's why we need to do all by His Word, because He's Lord and King. Well, how many times do we read that the Word of God does not change? And when you step outside of it, that's where all the chaos and social norms continue to change, the way people feel change, the way 
you know, you look at all the denominations of the world and how many changes there have been inside of that, but yet inside of the Word of God, it has not changed. It has always been constant. It will always remain constant. That's why you need to be doing speaking things of His Word and doing things of His Word because they will not change on you. They won't. The Bible will not, never drop out. <laughs> no, because it's truth. Well, in Christ's prayer to God, the first five verses in John 17, he talks about the authority that God gave him and that that is what brings people to God, his authority to bring them to God. So it's pivotal. Everything we do is um, encapsulated in his authority to tell us what to do and how to do it. And the end result is that he he has given back to God all those who will comply with those things. So in his name, I mean he 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 uses himself in the third person in that second verse mm -hmm. about the authority that you gave him, mm -hmm. referring to himself. So um, he has all authority on this earth and in heaven by right him. Yes. Right, right. In heaven and on earth. Exactly right. And may, maybe this is oversimplifying it, but it's commanded. Do all in His name. Well, that's a, that's a command for us to do. Um, we don't inherently know the right way to go. As Mike was making reference to, you, you look at the world around us, they try to follow their feelings, their emotions, what they think is good and right or what... Usually the magic formula is what works. Okay? What, what gets the big crowds in? Well, then that must be okay. Versus looking at what's the standard of truth. Let's stick to that. Um, so we don't inherently know the right way. And it's just a matter of respect, is it not? If we claim Christ as our Lord and Savior, as the master of our life, does it not follow that if we really believe that, if we really respect Him, then we go by His Word in all things. We go by His authority. Do you have something else, Rick? Yeah, just a quick point. That you see this lack of understanding on what it means by all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So much of the time you hear people making statements and that it can be something that has absolutely nothing to do with religion and that will end their statement in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're saying because everything I'm doing is in Jesus' name, I've got to. Right. It, it, it has nothing to do with... I sweep the floor in Jesus' name. Right. It has yeah. nothing to do with the authority of Jesus. It has to do with them saying that statement is basically what it has. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost like a magic formula. Whatever we do, we're going to be, you know, sometimes we forget... The body is a holy temple. Yes. I mean, we're disrespecting God when we do things outside of that. We, uh, in word or deed, if, you, if you're taking the Lord's name in vain, you're not only you're disrespecting God, you're disrespecting yourself, too. Uh, it's, uh, you're misusing what God has given you to glorify Him. Amen. Now, all the world is not our own. Or uh, we have a great deal to be thankful for. And knowing that, it can change the heart. Yes. Living under His authority in our lives. Very well. All right. Well, we, we need to move on. So hopefully we can get through four as well. Let's read uh, chapter 3, verse 18, down through chapter 4, verse 1. Colossians 3, 18 to 4, 1. Who will grab that for us? Clint. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service or people pleasers, but with a sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. 
For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Okay. Question number seven. I'd ask which of these is breaking down more in our society? He lists these things out. Which, where's our major issue? What? Uh, right there in the verse 18, the first word. Marriage. There are no wives. There are no husbands. It's <laughs> something that we don't need to do anymore. No okay. Marriage. Sometimes there's not even a father, right? So this 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 whole idea is now gone in many people's minds today. It doesn't apply to me. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, Rock. One of the things that um, we've observed, and I think our society has observed that has become a significant deterioration that probably began sometime after the Second World War was getting the mother out of the home. And the home structure began to disintegrate. And that also brought, therefore, stress upon the marriage. So for me, the root cause was the assault on the home. And that... You're walking in dangerous territory there, Ron. I don't go, go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, what God had purposed had been assaulted and no longer exists. Did Satan, um, I would say one of his greatest uh, tactics or achievements is an attack on the family to break that family relationship because that was God's first institution the husband and wife, they're given to each other to be together, to serve God in this life. If he can break down that base structure, then everything else that goes upon it crumbles, falls away. So yes, it, it is marriage. It is the home. It is that family relationship as God established it. Um, on the marriage thing, particularly, okay, we think... Our society, I, I believe, looks at it this way. The religious society around us. That they're troubled over what they see today and they might trace it back, oh, when homosexual marriage became legal. Right? But what was before that? Divorce. Divorce or remarriage for any cause. Well, but in marriage... What broke down marriage? You, you go back into the 50s, post-war, when divorce became more prevalent, when the laws went from you had to have very specific reasons under the law to divorce your spouse, to no-fault divorce, that totally wiped out this concept of marriage, what that marriage meant, what a covenant was, it, it wiped that out and it allowed them, you know, 40 years later in the 1990s, mid-90s, late-90s, to push this agenda, well, two men could get married. Well, you know, once you, as a society, approved adulterous marriages, that, they didn't realize it at the time, but that just threw the door open that marriage doesn't mean anything. It's a, it's, it's, we're at the point now, as Clint was saying, it's almost ridiculous in the law of the land because, you, you know, there are people who marry animals and you, you think, what? Yeah, there are people who marry animals under the law. What, so how do you define it? Well, of course, you've got to go back to what the Word of God says, but to this question of what's breaking down more in society... I, I personally would put down marriage. Marriage, the home, family. Joe? Well, he always attacked the women. He went for Eve in the garden. So, and I'm not going to go to this because this is a bit of really meaning more so. <laughs> but a lot of it started with the suffrage movement. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Nancy? Well, I think what we see in the home is that wives are not subject, husbands don't lead, and children have no guidance. Okay. Yes, that's all one big package that goes together. You break one and those others will, will break apart as well. Um, to Joe's point, in case you didn't hear it, was the suffrage movement. Now, what's in behind all of that? Look, there are things that have changed that have happened from the 1800s into the 20th century into today that I think we would probably all agree, hey, there's been some improvements in the way society views women. Okay? There are some things. There are some things is absolutely degraded women, completely and totally. Um, but there has been a concerted effort to overturn God's order. And the whole feminist movement is... It's, that's the ultimate agenda, to overturn God's order and relationship between husband and wife and the family, changing the family order. And that goes way back into the 1800s and it manifests itself in different ways. The abortion movement is a part of that as well. It, it's all one big movement. So in our culture, it's, it's been breaking down for a very long time. And we're seeing the fruits of it being manifest between families broken down, the high divorce rate, um, which the, going back to Ron's point about women going outside the home, uh, that's driven up cost of living. Uh, sometimes maybe people don't think about it. That, that's created an issue. Uh, why, why is it that we have so many more apartments today? Well, very often it's because there's a divorce and that income is split and so they have to get rid of the house and they've got to get apartments. There, there's just so many different things we can look at and see, wow, that's a result of the family being broken down. The riots. <laughs> riots that go on, that's part. Part of that is because that family structure is broken down. That discipline in the home has broken down. It's not there anymore. Father figures are missing. They're not leading. Clint, do you have something else? 20 years ago when I was in college, this was a secular class that I was attending. And, you know, it's in the textbooks. When the morality of the society of women breaks down, the entire culture or nation falls apart. It's a pattern. They'll document it. It's in the Romans. It's in the Babylonians. It's Whenever the women morality is deteriorated, the entire nation crumbles. Mm -hmm. And it just fits the pattern here of what God has sent. And so I doubt that they ever teach that now. But but it was taught before. Right. Well, Paul, whenever he uh, talks in Ephesians about this issue also, he specifically charges husbands. He says, Husbands, you need to love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do that, then we're in violation of these scriptures also. And I know that in society we look at, you know, wives be subject to your husbands. Who would not want to be subject to someone who loved them the way that Christ loved the church? And we have to create a situation where our wives want to, to be subjected to us because they know that we have the very best of the intentions in our heart for them, and they are for, for, foremost in our relationships, of all relationships in the entire time world. Right. Now, I would just add, you would think every woman would want to be subject to a man like that, but with the indoctrination that's taking place in our society, they don't even want to hear that concept. And so that's that's a real tough thing to explain or to teach or to get that concept across in our modern society. Um, there, have been time, there have been men in times past that they ruled with an iron fist. And that is part of what the devil uses as leverage to go against God's order. Instead of attacking the 
abuse, the mishandling, they attack the very structure itself. And that's, that's the problem that we have, is that structure now has been ripped apart um, and very few believe in it. Even in the denominational world, there are very few who actually believe what the Bible teaches about husband, wife, marriage relationship, you know, parents, children, that relationship. There's very few who actually convicted on it. Paul, you have something? Yeah. Uh, if you draw a big circle there from Blackboard, and you put a little dot right down on the bottom of it with a sharpie, or you could even go with a ballpoint pen. That's the church of Christ. The rest of the world is on their own. They do the things they want to do and everything else. Not that the church of Christ is any special than anything else. It's it is more. special. I, I, I gotta gotta hold you there a second. The elect and holy beloved of God. We are special, unique, precious God's elect and nation among all people on earth. We are most definitely special. And Christ dwells in the hearts of the members of His kingdom. Yes. They will tend to be godly women. Now, if you put a godly woman in the world. It's, she's going to rebel against um, abuse. And that draws her away from God, the abuse. She's trying to be a godly woman, but she's living in a, a non godly world. And she's surrounded by this. And naturally she's going to go the opposite way. And of course that's what the devil wants. So that's where most of the world is, is an ungodly world. Well, the devil will use Any mistreatment against a godly woman to try to get her to turn against God. Amen. But it doesn't follow. If, if she's truly committed to God, she stays committed to God, she's not going to leave God because of the way somebody else behaves. She'll draw closer to God. She'll leave that marriage, though. Not necessarily. Some do. Most of them have. <laughs> I'm not sure I would agree with that. Okay. Well, uh, we're, we try to convert people. And we try to convert them with our actions. Lots, all of us are not teachers. All of us are not uh, preachers. So about the only way we can do things is to our actions. And what does this have to do with husband wife? It, it, if she if she can't convert her husband, she she'll submit to him in ungodly ways. Not true. Not true. Not true. Absolutely not true. First Peter chapter three talks about the woman who's married to an unbeliever, and she maintains her holiness in spite of her husband. Yes, Joe. I was going to say. Her example, her good example, can actually lead him to change. It. it can, it can open the door, but it always has to be the truth that's taught and accepted to convert someone. It doesn't always happen that way, but that the Bible clearly says that that is something that we should strive to, that she should strive to do, live it out right. so she can, she can convert him or her, or, her, or the other way. Right. It would apply the other way as well. Right. Exactly right. All right. So. It says wives submit to husbands, be subject to them. Um, at, under his leadership and it does not degrade the wife in that relationship when she submits the son submits to the father and so it doesn't degrade that relationship of the son and the father husbands are to love their wives as um, Mike pointed out a few minutes ago over in Ephesians he says as Christ loved the church a sacrificial love, a love of devotion and service to her. And when those two things are going on in that marriage relationship, that'll be a strong and healthy, good marriage relationship. The children are to obey their parents. What does it say? Obey parents in what? <laughs> in all things. To whom is that written? Children? Children? Well, all of us, really. Well, yeah. Two, two-year-olds, three-year-olds? Those that can understand, I guess, would be the point. Yeah, and really the 
for this is well pleasing to the Lord. We want to teach these concepts when they're young, but this is really children who are old enough to grasp that concept, they have a responsibility and a duty before the Lord. So this would go into those teenage years, right? Any other thoughts there? All right, what about the servants and the masters? What's he teaching there? Question eight, why is it important for Christians to do a good job? It is because sometimes the example is the first introduction of Christ to other people before anything is spoken. And they see a difference in an attitude in the those who are seeking to know will ask. Mm. And because, first and foremost, you're not serving that person, you're serving God. Okay, that's, that's the thing. And in all these relationships, that's really the emphasis that's being put down. It's not first your relationship to the other person. It's first your relationship to God and then that relationship to the person. You don't do it necessarily because of them. You do it because you serve God and you want to fulfill your duties and set the right example. That includes these servants here. Uh, to set that right example for others. Um, those of you who have been in the workforce, I, I don't know if you've experienced this, but sometimes there are certain people you know because of their background, they're difficult. It could be certain religious groups. You know people who come out of that, they're going to be difficult to deal with. Okay, For example, in... East Texas, where we lived each year, the United Pentecostal Church had like a 30,000 attended camp meeting. Whenever they came into town, every server in the restaurants in town utterly despised that time because they were rude, they didn't tip well. It was just, you knew that was their character, how they were gonna be. All right, so apply that to a Christian in the workplace. Christians do not want the reputation of being the difficult one, the lazy one, the, you know, talk back one. They, we don't want that reputation. It looks bad on God's people. We want to be that if somebody says, you know what, Joe is a member of the Church of Christ and everyone I've ever experienced who's been from that, they're great workers, they're humble, they're honest, they, they go above and beyond. That's the kind of reputation we want to have, and that's what Paul's talking about here. We want to set that good example in society around us. All right, any other thoughts there? So we have exactly four minutes for chapter four. All right, let's read verses two through six. We'll get as far as we can here, and I'll have to say we have to leave it here. I'm sorry, but we just have to leave it here. Go, Mike. Devote yourselves to prayer, keep an alert, in, with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the Word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which we have also been imprisoned, for that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward, with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Okay. So, he focuses on prayer, continuing earnestly in it, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, so emphasizing the importance of prayer and our application of that in our daily life. I want to get to question two, though. For whom were the Colossians to pray and why? And how does that apply to us today? What does Paul say there? Who's he ask prayers for? For us. For us. Him. For him. Right. Do um, you ever find it funny that an apostle asks for prayers of regular Christians? He did need it. Exactly right. The apostles, if the apostles needed prayers 
of others, then we certainly need the prayers of others, right? And how does this apply to us today? What, what's he saying pray about? Med, what? The, Have the doors open. So open. The door open for the gospel to be preached. And what else? Verse 4. Well, he's praying for the complete mission of Christ on this earth. So the mission hasn't changed and the method hasn't changed. So both of those things have to be prayed for and opportunities taken. And opportunity is the key thing there, is asking God to give you opportunities. Mm -hmm. And He does. When you ask, He does. Right. Right. That, for that door to be open, that door opens up. And He says that I make it manifest as I ought to speak. That, that I'll, I'll be able to teach and I'll say the things that I ought to say. I'll be bold enough to teach what I need to teach. So all those things. So how do we apply this today? Us here at Newton. What should we be praying for? Same things. Same things. Okay. <laughs> Specifically? Specifically. Opportunity to share the gospel. Okay. Nice. Well, uh, for you and for mm -hmm. the members here to be able to do what we need to do and that we could be s scripturally organized here. Hey, we definitely want to get there. TV program? We need to be praying about that. the TV program, that it will reach people, there will be good and honest hearts. We can pray about the website because there's people who visit the website or the Facebook page as Rick's talked about. There's you know, more and more people following that Facebook page. Individual efforts of Christians because various ones talk to friends, neighbors, co-workers, things like that. Uh, visitors at our services. We pray that we will have visitors, that there will be a door of opportunity open there to teach them. We need to be praying about these things, having this top in our mind. Chris? Bring the wisdom in the work so that we can understand and get it spread more easily. Yeah, well, we have the wisdom to be able to teach the things that people need to hear to help them to know God and to serve Him. So, question three, just we'll take one minute on this. What is the end purpose of our speech as mentioned in verse six? Grace, season with salt, do what? No, how to answer it. Know how to answer each one. Exactly right. Know how to answer people. There's, there are times when people need an encouragement, need gentleness, need um, help and understanding and concept of the Word of God. There are times when people need admonishment. They need a rebuke on things. In those situations, we have to make a judgment at times of how we ought to answer, but pray for that wisdom so we know how to answer people. Because the ultimate goal of all of it is to save souls and uphold truth. Alright, thank you all very much, Lord willing. We're going to start the book of Revelation next week. We have some booklets here. If anybody needs a booklet of worksheets and things like that, please be sure to grab one before you leave.